back to the show where we are talking all things mental health well-being in the workplace. But what happens when you actually get that money at the end of the month? Well, you know, there is a way to manage your finances and that's why we have our next guest on the show, Carol Glynn, who is the founder of Conscious Finance Coaching. Carol, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's so great to have you on because I feel like all of us uh, have discussed this off show as well. When it comes to our finances, we're not as organized and structured as we really should be. Uh, so just from the offset, tell me when that monthly salary comes in, Yeah. what is the first thing I should be doing? Ideally, the first thing you should be doing is setting some money aside for savings, investing, your future self, mm. as I like to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and then that gives you, it's a bit like going to the gym first thing in the morning, your day is then clear. It's the same thing with money. You can go, oh, okay, I know what I have now and I can relax a little bit about it. Okay. All right. I mean, there is some logic though to not doing that. <laughs> so you think, let me just spend, spend at the end of the month, I'll have more than 20% or 30% or mm -hmm. whatever. Because once I've set the goal, like I'm going to put 20% away, mm. but I'm like, I can play with the rest of this. Yeah. Uh, whereas maybe if I was just constantly paranoid, then I'd save more. What do you think? I think that depends on your personality because that could go either way. For the vast majority of the people I see, they, they hope that that would be the case. <laughs> but as humans, if it's there, we tend to use it. Yeah. So we do tend to spend more. And then at the end of the month, I constantly hear my clients say, but I, it just fell through my hands. I don't know what happened. <laughs> and then it's not the 20%. What I would say is put aside, let's say the 20% if that's your goal. And then if you've got money left at the end of the month, also save that. So then you can do it, sandwich it on both yeah, sides. Makes sense. I guess Dubai as well, because there's so much to do, it's kind of difficult to resist the temptation. Yeah. Um, obviously, we write about mental health all the time. So I'm interested to get, you know, when you're sitting down with clients, that relationship between problems with money yeah. or not having enough money and their mental health, like how do you address that or what do you see when you're talking to people? Oh, it's really significant. I mean, money is often um, in research shown as the number one cause of stress worldwide for men and women. It is quoted as a major issue in relationships, you know, in the top three reasons why relationships don't work out. Um, and a lot of it is it, it's a mix, so the mindset is really important. Our, our experiences with money growing up, how we have felt about it and how that is then projecting in our lives right now. How do I work with people? We look into, you know, what is your first experience with money? How do you feel about money? Do you think money is the root of all evil is a common one I hear. Or I feel stupid when it comes to money, like really negative thoughts about money that then actually cause behaviours that are not serving you. So very often when we talk about money, we look at budgeting, we look at saving, we look at spreadsheets and everyone goes, oh, this is <laughs> not very interesting. But while that's really, really important, it is hand in hand with your feelings around money, your subconscious behaviors around money. Um, because like a lot of stress in life, it's actually how we feel about the situation is more impactful than the reality of the situation. Sometimes, I, just today, I had a call with a lady and she said, I was so stressed for so long because I was sure I was like so bad with money and it was really embarrassing and it was all these negative things. And when we looked at the reality, she went, oh, it's not that bad. Mm. But she was experiencing all this stress yeah. for so long and, you know, denying it, denying it wasn't that Financial bad. Financial compassion. <laughs> it is, yeah, self-compassion with finances and, and it, it's a big part of it and believing that you can be good with money. You know, it's not for other people. I have the opposite feeling. I know I'm very good at spending money <laughs> and I'm very proud of that. <laughs> but in the workplace, uh, what is the main problem that employers feel that they have when it comes to managing their money? It is, um, it, well, it's really that, managing their yeah. money and how that is then playing out in the workplace. There's a lot of research around this as well that talks about the amount of time employees are spending at work worrying or working on financial problems be it talking to the bank, figuring out their budget, talking to their partners, making payments, and even just generally stressed and what that does to us and how we turn up at work. So this is why it's really beneficial actually for employers to provide financial literacy support for their employees. Because if we are reducing that stress that everyone is experiencing, then we're more productive. So it's a win-win. Um, but employees, you know, it's the same across the board. It is, how do I manage my money if I have debt? How can I get out of it? How can I prevent it in the future? How do I plan for retirement? Um, and finding the right source of information for that Definitely. is really important. I think financial education is key mm -hmm. here because it's something that we're not really taught. I mean, you're taught to, you know, 
learn a job, learn a skill set, go to work, start making that money. But then actually when the money starts coming in, what do you do with it and how do you make your money work for you? That's just a buzz phrase that I've <laughs> yeah. heard around. But <laughs> sort of interesting for bosses as well because if employees are not stressed about money, then they, can, they don't necessarily have to go on to the next better paid job, even if they don't really want that better paid job. Mm. Do you want people who are happy, you know, who can cope with the kind of financial structure that they have at that point? So there's a real win-win for employees to embrace financial education. It absolutely is, because some employers that I speak to about potentially working with them with um, delivering these services, they're worried that, oh, is this going to mean I'm going to have like a stampede of requests for salary increases? And I say, actually, it tends to do the opposite, because it's not about what you earn, it's about what you do with it. And there's also research that shows that when someone gets a salary increase, we're elated for like three days. And then, and then it just gets absorbed and we're looking for the next one. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not intentional with our money, then we just want more and more and more. But actually, if someone is quite secure in what they're earning and intentional with how they're spending, they become more content with it. And I mean, that does open up other doors, but employers actually see, they see less disgruntlement about mm -hmm. salaries. Um, when we offer these services. So it's absolutely a win-win on both sides. Carol, this is very, very fascinating. There's so much to talk about, but we do have to move on to DXB in 60, I'm afraid. Amy? It's now time for DXB in 60 indeed. So Scott, we are going to put you into the hot seat. We want oh, to get yeah. to know you a little bit better. So in 60 seconds, we're gonna ask some questions. Are okay. you ready? Go for it. Okay, here we go. Let's start the clock. If you weren't working in the mental health space, which industry would you be working in? I'd like to be a writer, I think. Very author. nice. One thing that you cannot live with? I at... cannot, live, cannot live without uh, family. <laughs> very good, very important. Your motto in life and work? Be kind to yourself. Your hidden gem in Dubai? Oh, um, my polo club gym type thing. Very good. Your inspiration in life? My daughter. The book that you're reading at the moment? 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman. Very nice. Top series that you've watched this summer? Uh, we finally finished off Succession, which was fantastic. Okay, I've heard a lot of good things about that. Top podcast recommendation? The Mental Space, but that is mine, but Nimi's got some pretty good ones as well. <laughs> <laughs> if you could hang with someone for 24 hours, who would it be? It would probably be my daughter, Autumn. Oh, amazing. And what's, who is the most interesting person that you've met in the city? Bizarre answer. It's me over the last couple of years when I've actually begun to discover myself. Oh, incredible. I love that. I love that. Well, time up. Lovely to get to know you, Scott, a little bit better. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank it's you. been a pleasure having you back on the show. And thank you, Carol, as well, for your time. Now, here is a sneak peek at the sole artist performing on tonight's show. So let's take a look. Hi guys, my name is Sean from the United States. Stay tuned for a performance tonight. Don't miss out. <laughs> 